let's, let's meditate. So yeah, just settling back into a comfortable posture. Ah, letting the body soften. Well, if we can soften our bodies, can we also soften our minds? What would that mean? Letting the attention settle in the body. Coming into stillness and balance. Letting the breath deepen. Maybe for just a couple breaths to help you to settle. and connecting your awareness with the sensations of breath. Feeling the movement and rhythm of the breath. Awareness of the breath, being like riding a soothing wave, floating on a wave on the ocean, rising and falling gently. and letting a smile of appreciation come to your lips. Just a gentle turning up of the corners of the mouth. And let that smile brighten the mind and radiate out through the body, through the heart. A sense of openness and expansiveness bright luminous
When the mind drifts away, just gently bringing it back. Back to the rhythm and touch of breath. Finding the joy of present moment awareness, quiet, peaceful joy. Sometimes when the mind wanders, we build up stress or some agitation. So when we wake up from that, we need to apply a little attention to that energy, to soften that, to see if we can figure out what it means to let go, which really starts with just allowing and being with, without of building, building that stress or agitation. This is the subtle effort of meditation. Wherein we give attention to the difficult without feeding it. This takes care and balance, balance of mind. to feel and allow and yet release. So mindfulness of the body and breath helps in this process. 
so that we stay with the body and the breath as we release that agitation. That way the mind doesn't become caught again in the cycle of stress and agitation. And finally, we settle back just to the simplicity of breath itself. Practicing meditation gives us the opportunity to ask what is happiness.
we sit and do nothing. We sit with our body, with our thoughts, with our feelings. We watch. We see our mind chasing after, chasing after the future or the past or wishes, regrets, resentments. And as we watch the mind and body and the feelings, becomes clear that what we call happiness is created through these processes. That simply sitting here, doing nothing, we can become happy or we can become unhappy. And in this way, we become motivated to develop more power from our mind, more capacity, our capacity to be undisturbed by what arises in the mind and undisturbed in the mind from what arises externally. This is one of the core purposes and challenges of our meditation practice. In this work, we realize that we cannot completely control our minds and that in fact, that effort itself can create more struggle. So we come face to face with the central paradox of this practice. how to grow, how to let go, how to cultivate without creating the conditions for more suffering. And again, we are thrown back on our capacity for awareness. It's only through our awareness that we can see this process play out and tune into the behaviors, the attitudes that are helpful and let go of those that are not. an accident. Uh, sometimes things just come up. And I don't usually talk a lot right at the end of the meditation, but uh, yeah, just was kind of what showed up. So 
uh, one of the things I sort of really actually do enjoy about just working with you guys over over such a long period of time is that I do feel kind of free to just be spontaneous and not sort of stick to a script. Um, since, you know, <laughs> the script would get really old by now. <laughs> It'd be like, is he gonna say the same thing again? Um, so I, I, I was never good at uh, playing the same guitar solo twice in a row. <laughs> so it's kind of the same thing. So, um, yeah, we we kind of ended uh, step nine in one breath at a time, and then uh, you know I thought about how I never addressed um, the promises that are in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I never addressed them in that book or or really in any other book until. Um, the daily reflections. And so I thought it would be a nice little uh, side trip to take. Um, so the daily reflections uh, have the promises in September um, since that's the ninth month and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I kind of take a day for each of them. Um, so, um, so it happens that this is on September 11th, uh, a new happiness. Um, when I noticed that this morning, I just was thinking about that. I, I, did, uh, I did very little in writing this book of trying to like match up the topics of the day with any sort of meaning of that day, other than I think like Valentine's Day and uh, Christmas and um, uh Fourth of, Fourth of July, I did something on interdependence, but I, this is not meant to be related to the historical events of September 11th at all. So sorry if that's, I don't know if that disturbed anybody. Um, okay, a new happiness. The second promise, a new happiness is pretty enticing. Who doesn't want happiness, new or otherwise? But what could be new about happiness? If we look at the old happiness, we can get some insight. For an addict, happiness was having a good stash and no responsibilities. I don't know if that's a complete, but it's some of it. Uh, that way you could get as loaded as you wanted without having to worry about the consequences. Unfortunately, there were always consequences, whether physical, emotional, social, professional, or otherwise. Our so-called happiness was always short-lived and often came with the big price. The happiness of recovery has none of these drawbacks. It's the happiness of clarity, waking up and remembering everything about the night before. It's the happiness of honesty, no secrets to protect or lies to cover up. It's the happiness of connection, letting people know who we are and learning to know them in meaningful ways, going through your day without guilt, shame, or regret, knowing that if we make, even if we make a mistake, we can own up to it and move on. As addicts, we associated happiness with ecstatic moments and exciting events. We wanted to heighten our experience of life. In recovery, we learned to appreciate the quiet moments, the moments of serenity and peace. We take joy from a walk in the woods, a meal with a friend, a job well done. We discover that life itself is enough without the enhancements of intoxication or adrenaline rushes. Today, reflect on what brings you happiness and recovery. Take joy in your new happiness. <laughs> ah, that's pretty nice. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. <laughs> um, yeah, it's such a it's such an interesting subject, isn't it? Happiness, you know. And and when I when I read that this morning, before my morning sit, I um I then thought about uh, my book, Recovering Joy. So I want to bring a little bit of that into the conversation. 
Um, you know, just the, this idea that, you know, we were chasing happiness uh, in our, um, in our addiction. And that, that, uh, you know, that, um, the Buddhist, uh, you know, the, when the Buddha talks about why we have all these problems, <laughs> like why things don't really work for us, he starts with this idea of ignorance, which is like has a particular meaning in Buddhism. It means that you don't understand how suffering happens or how happiness happens. It, it doesn't mean that you, there's some that you're stupid or uneducated. It, it means that there's some basic truth that you don't understand and that you're acting out of that misunderstanding. So, and that's exactly what addiction is. We, we have this basic misunderstanding about what happiness is. And, and one of the w ways that I think we think we miss what happiness is, is that we think that it's a mood. And, and I want it to be in a, in some kind of good mood or hap, you know, positive mood or buoyant mood or ecstatic mood all the time. And I didn't want, and I couldn't deal with, you know, painful moods. So, you know, as I've come to understand happiness and recovery, it's not about how I'm feeling all the time, it, which, and, and, you know, I kind of say all this here, maybe I'll just read this uh, part and then talk about it some more. So this is from my book, Recovering Joy, which the only version copy of it I could find was the uncorrected proof. But uh, since, you know, this is, you know, show and tell, uh, and, and, and this, I published this with Sounds True in 2015. So after the introduction, ch chapter one is called Not Unhappy. And, and that was actually what I was considering calling the book, not unhappy, um, but <laughs> they weren't so sure that it was gonna be, have like the same zing. <laughs> I liked it. Which is kind of Buddhist too. At the, the Sutta class last night, yesterday we were talking about how the, in Buddhism they, use these negative terms, non ill will, non hatred, instead of just saying love and compassion, you know, not non greed, and you could say generosity, but, but uh, so not unhappy kind of goes along with that kind of uh, thinking about the using language, which again, is sort of how I think of it. It's like, if I just take away unhappiness, then I'm okay. Don't need to add anything. All right. So just chapter one, not unhappy. When you hear the word happiness, you probably have your own sense of its meaning. Before I got sober, I thought it meant something like being in a good mood all the time or having loads of fun with no responsibilities. That's not how I define happiness now. In fact, several years ago, when stuck in a long period of difficult moods, depression and irritability, I found myself saying, I'm depressed, but I'm not unhappy. What did that mean? What I was saying was that nothing was wrong with my life. I was healthy, had a loving family that I adored, and found great satisfaction in my work. I understood by that time that troubling moods seemed to be a persistent, if intermittent, part of my life, but that they didn't impinge on the essential value and meaning of my life or the satisfaction I derived from it. I think it has partly been this attitude towards moods that has allowed me to be less controlled by them. So obviously I'm saying that happiness isn't just a mood, that, uh, that doesn't mean we can be happy without ever being in a good mood. Certainly having access to joyful and uplifting feelings on a fairly regular basis is part of what I'd call happiness. But happiness is more than that. I think it includes and depends upon the following elements, which are the main chapters of this book. Integration of values and behavior satisfying interpersonal relationships, satisfying work, a rich inner life, an element of fun in our lives, a healthy relationship to money 
and basic financial security, a sense of purpose and our own value. So, you know, this was sort of my attempt to make, really make sense of, of happiness for myself, because as I say, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I, I had, st I've struggled with depression. And so it's hard to sort of see like how that, how that fits into being happy. What's the relationship? And, and, you know, the key thing what for me has been keeping this broader view of what my life is about and what's of value in my life and what, you know, what the bigger picture and, and seeing, so that, that's, we could say there's appreciation there, but of course, you know, the, I, I think the starting point for every addict and certainly for depressives who are addicts is learning to be with the difficult. You know, if we can learn to be with the difficult without, especially without acting out and relapsing, but also without going down that rabbit hole and taking sort of merging with it. You know, there's a way in which it's very compelling that depressive feeling that it just sort of, it's so, um, you know, it hurts so good, you know, to quote uh, John Cougar Mellencamp, you know, it's, it, it's this strange kind of pain that's, that uh, it, it feels, um, well, for one thing, it feels meaningful, which is what, why I think a lot of art is created by depressives, you know, uh, and, and why a lot of art is depressing, if you will. I mean, I, I know, you know, that, that sort of uh, pain and, and suffering and, and is something that we dramatize a lot. You know, that's what tragedy is. So there's something rich and, and, and it does have meaning. It does, it, there is a value in it. There's a beauty in that. Uh, but it's also becomes this, you know, in Buddhist terms sort of defines who you are, it becomes yourself. And, and it's hard to, I, I'm not sure why it is, but it has this, it's like the good mood self doesn't, can, you know, when you get in the good mood, it's like, oh, now I feel normal. But maybe when you're in de depressive space, you feel more like yourself. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm really kind of just grasping at straws here a little bit, but, but um, in any case, you know, learning to hold the feelings without what they, you know, what it calls proliferating, right? Without letting it become the whole story and, and projecting, oh God, now I'm in this mood and it's going to be like this, you know, oh, what's going to happen and how am I going to deal with it? And, and all of that, um, and as well as acting it out, um, you know, taking it out on people is a, a really one of the really uh, unfortunate, you know, effects. Um, so, okay, <laughs> I'm getting myself into a bad mood by talking about this. I got to talk about the positive. <laughs> That's one of the things I've noticed. Like when you give a talk about joy, like ah, everybody's in a good mood. So one of the key things, and you know, we come back to this over and over, Buddhist principle, everything is impermanent. And like knowing that, okay, it's going to pass, it's going to pass. And just like keep swimming, you know, it's going to pass, you're going to get through it. Um, again, so key. So I guess a, a big part of what I'm talking about here because I've talked about ignorance is right view, which again, we were talking about yesterday. And that was the, the sutta we talked about yesterday. Right view is like having the big picture, having, having the picture of what is, what is real, what's reality. And so right view is reminds you that everything is impermanent, that um, 
a feeling is just a feeling. It's it's not a fact. You know that that uh, thoughts are created in the mind and they are conditioned, and and so it have when you have right view, you don't have ignorance in that moment, and so ignorance is the thing that's that's confusing us and and sending us down those rabbit holes, and when we can so stepping back and just taking that big picture, even though, you know, the pic, we're taking picture and it's like, oh, it hurts the picture, but it's okay because I'm not, I'm not the picture, you know, I'm not the feeling. It's, it's not defining me. It's not a solid thing. It's just, you know, a really unpleasant experience of being a human right now. You know, and, and when we think about when we act on addiction, it's this need for this moment to be okay. I can't accept if just this moment, I can't tolerate this moment not being okay. And, you know, the resilience and the power of recovery allows us to be like, okay, this, it's okay if this moment is not okay. I can be with a difficult moment, just keep going because I know that a difficult moment doesn't define my life. It doesn't define who I am. It's not a permanent thing. It's, it's not a, a uh, yeah, it's, it's not defining. It's not the who. Uh, and again, right view is that reminder of like this idea of self and who I am. Uh, and that whole story is a creation. And, and, you know, when we sit in meditation, it's one of the things that we see. We see our mind creating self. We see our mind creating these stories. And and, and we go, oh, well, you know, when you catch yourself at the end of one of those stories, like, wow, look where I just got to. Like, you can kind of snap out of it. Like, wow, that was an interesting one. You know, like, what what was I doing there, you know? Um, you know, that's the power of mindfulness. It's the gift of mindfulness that it allows us to, to separate from the, this thoughts that are, are so that we identify with so much, you know, um, so I th I think it's really important for addicts to re redefine happiness and to define it for themselves. And, and, and to me, it's about my life. It's not about a moment. It's not about an achievement. Uh, it's not about anything that's, you know, really impermanent. I remember uh, you know, when my father died that, and I was talking about him recently because we were talking in step nine about how I felt the distinct difference between the grieving that I felt for him and the depression that I'd had very often in my life, how the depression was so self-centered and uh, just inward and solipsistic, you know, whereas the, the grief was like this healthy, natural, normal sadness. And I, and I was able to be with that. And it was like, oh, yeah, this is okay. This is totally okay. I don't have to get lost in this. It just hurts, but it's not wrong. It doesn't feel like something is broken. It just feels like this is life. So that was a gift, that was a gift in recovery, you know. So a new happiness. Um, <laughs> oh, thanks, Myrna. <laughs> Diagnosing my Enneagram. I've never had that done, thanks. Um, so, uh, you know, there you go. There's my morning rant, um, if you will. I hope it's helpful and um, be happy to hear other voices if anyone has any any thoughts to contribute or questions or answers or
Go ahead, Jared. Uh, good morning, Kevin. Thanks. Yeah, um, I like what you're saying about redefining a new happiness because um, I create these conditions that, well, how can I be happy when this has happened and this has happened and, you know, I've had this loss or this trauma or, or whatever. And, you know, I get, I settle into this, this thing where, you know, I don't allow myself to be happy. And in order to, um, to, to redefine that, I have to kind of come into the space of, of, uh, living now and, um, and allowing myself to, um, find something besides, uh, my, my story that, that, um, has been, that I just get stuck in. So that's all. Yeah. Thanks. You know, I think about you know, the, the teaching on the four noble truths. The first thing the Buddha says is everybody suffers. <laughs> so when we get into our own story, you know, a lot of our own story is about, yeah, but my suffering, you don't know about my suffering. It's like my suffering is special. It's like, uh, you know, I can't handle my, no one would be able to handle my suffering, you know? And, uh, you know, all the ways that that works against us, that kind of thinking. And, you know, it, it was a great, the combination of that teaching and going to, AA meetings and hear, hearing people talk about their suffering was very freeing for me to realize, oh, this is not some unique thing, you know. I thought I was especially cursed, you know, with, with uh, emotional pain. And then I realized, now I realize, oh no, <laughs> there's nothing special about your emotional pain. It's just, you know, it has its own color and tinge and everything, you know, tone, but it's not uh, not unique. And that's freeing, right? That's the idea because not unique means not self. <laughs> you know, that's the, the, the kind of end point of not unique. Um, I see another hand up, Jasmine, hi. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, hi. Yeah, it's, it's interesting what you've, just been talking about because um i had an experience yesterday um where i was in <coughs> physical pain um poss possibly caused by emotional pain and stress or wh wh whatever it was it I, I felt it all through my body and <coughs> and i've been listening to lots of things like you and, and other people and about watching it and i and i properly did it i properly watched my body do do it go through it and it was really strange it kind of transformed <laughs> and even though I was, I was still in pain I started smiling and that and then the pain went <laughs> and, it, and I was carrying on smiling walking around the house like everything was I don't know it was just <laughs> bizarre you know it was and um I'm kind of worried about getting addicted to pain now but you know <laughs> <laughs> we talked about that last week didn't we but <laughs> but um it, it was that whole kind of like just just in my mind kind of stepping back and observing it and letting it happen not running away from it not trying to go and eat a lot of ice cream or or whatever it is but just that just being with it and even though it, it was still there I was smiling mm. and I wasn't trying to smile it just happened. Mm. Yeah. So I just wanted to share that. that so it kind of links yeah. to what you were saying. That's great. That's great. And uh, yeah, I mean, what you're describing really is the power of mindfulness. This is how people kind of view mindfulness as a higher power, you know, that, you know, it's not an external higher power. It's something that we have, we have this potential and and it is really, really, it, just having that moment 
it obviously it was very useful in that moment because it it improved your that moment for you but the but the important thing is the insight that comes from that because now you've seen how wow pain is actually not what i thought it was right that when you change your relationship to it it actually changes the pain it's just one of the sort of miracles of this practice. And, uh, you know, it's not a guarantee that every time you, you know, have pain, you just like click that on, you know, it would be nice. But, so it's not so much that you're going to necessarily be able to recreate that experience, but you can recreate that view, that right view that helps you to hold it. So that if it's difficult, you can still like, okay, I see this is happening. And, and I mean, it is really interesting to watch physical pain. It was something that when I used to have better knees, I would meditate with my legs crossed and I would typically start to have pain after 30 minutes or so. And I would work with it and I, I de developed this whole other relationship to it because it, it actually helped my mind to focus. So it's not that I wanted it to happen, but it forced me to really be focused because when my mind would wander, then my, my knees would hurt more. But when I would just relax and just, okay, I can be with this. And, and it's kind of like it shrinks it. Whereas the, you know, when we're in pain, it's like our mind goes to that place and that becomes the whole of our reality. But when we open up with mindfulness, it's more like spacious and it's just like a point in space. This The sensation is just in at this particular point, and, but it's in this much bigger container. So it doesn't feel so overwhelming. It doesn't feel like the, the whole of who we are and the whole of our experience. It just, you can sort of watch it as, you know, as this kind of point of sensation. And then you get to see the further insight, like, oh, it's moving. It's, it's like, it's, it's you're pulsing or, you know, moving around or, you know, and if you, if you start to actually look for the center point, it's like, wow, where's the center? Like, where is the pain? Like it isn't anywhere. It really, it's, you know, it's sort of like this thing that's not, that you can't, it's like quicksilver. You can't quite grasp it. So all of that um, shifts the, the view and the, and, and, changes your whole experience of it and and again it it just shows us how powerful our minds are you know in in, in creating our experience of life uh, and that's what enlightenment is you know is changing the mind so radically that you know uh, that that we ex experience life in a completely different way yeah thank you so are you are you in the UK? Or are you? Yes, we are. You are whereabouts? Bolton near Manchester. Say again. Bolton near Manchester. Uh huh. Okay. Sort of like the uh, cent north, 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 north central Manchester. industrial uh, area. Right. Soccer crazies or football Apparently. crazies. <laughs> yeah. I have some in laws uh, uh, there, so yeah. We're we're meditation crazy. Oh, much more healthy. There are very few meditation hooligans. You know. We might start it. <laughs> nice to have you with us. Is that mom who's there with you? No, we're just friends. 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 We're just friends. Okay. Welcome. Okay. Um, Brian. He's got his hand up. Whoop. Did we lose Brian? Oh no, there he is. Did you Sorry, want to say I something, am, Brian? Yeah, what's up? Yeah, um, just wanted to just onto what you're talking about. Um, yeah, I I just wanted to comment about some of the little things that I've, I've experienced. I have a a meditation bench that I use sometimes, 
And a lot of times I get like this Charlie horse in my, the back of my, in my foot and like mm-hmm. the arch. Yeah. And one time I had gotten it and I just tried to be with it. And it was pretty, it was really interesting and intense to, 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 cause that having a, a Charlie horse was really sharp. And I just like somehow was able to stay with it. And, and I watched it just kind of dissipate. And it was so amazing to see that. And the other thing is, is um, I, what, I, what I've been doing is, is I try to like, I don't like cold showers. And I've noticed when I go into a cold, when, I, when I'm in the shower, I'm, I'm, I'm testing myself, challenging uh-huh. myself to see what it's like. <laughs> and man, it's amazing how I can be with the coldness. So I mean, as soon as it gets really cold, I'm just with it for at least a certain period of time. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, yeah, I, I just wanted to comment on that. Well, you might consider moving to a monastery. You can really have all kinds of ascetic experiences, you know, the, uh, and, but, but you, what you're talking and pointing to with the cold shower particularly is, is exactly what ascetic practices are about by like limiting, <clears throat> excuse me, by limiting when you eat and, uh, you know, sort of sacrificing things intentionally. The what the purpose of that? Because you know, I was raised a Catholic, and it was like that sort of ascetic practice was the way I was t- taught that it was like penance. You were doing it to like get rid of the sins or something, which is not at all the point of ascetic practices from a Buddhist viewpoint. And and I don't actually believe it is from Catholic either. I think it's a corruption. But the the point of ascetic practices is to, just as you said, sort of raise the bar in your capacity to maintain equanimity through challenging experiences, which, you know, a lot of the time you might think, well, why do I need to do that? <laughs> Isn't life hard enough? And And you can certainly make that argument. But as, as people develop, some people anyway, on a spiritual path, they feel like, oh, you know, I gain so much every time I let go. I gain so much by n- learning to not be averse to things that I want to really challenge myself. And, and uh, in the monastic tradition, the, uh, there, there is a tradition uh, Ajahn Amaro talks about this in the Thai forest tradition. They have certain ascetic practices that they're allowed to do that they can take on like extra things. And one of them is to not uh, sleep lying down, for instance. And there are some monks who will go for years without ever lying down. Um, uh, there, there are certain ones that have to do with your robes and, you know, not getting new robes, only wearing rag robes and things that are really about your ego, right? Like, I will look good. Uh, so it, it can really, sound, it can be very off-putting. These ideas can be very off-putting if you don't understand the purpose of them. It's kind of like when somebody says to you, like, God, you, you gave up drinking, like, that's, you know, that's such a drag. I'm so sorry you had to give up drinking, right? And you're like, are you kidding me? It's like the best thing that ever happened to me that I gave up drinking. It's because to to a lot of people, not drinking would be an ascetic practice, right? So I think people in recovery can understand how the value of of just taking on uh, practices of letting go can really be useful. So fun thought. Um, I I have a few minutes if there's if someone else wanted to say something otherwise. Um, yeah, Jim. Hey. Hi, Kevin. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, yeah, I I really enjoyed your uh, meditation uh, this morning, and um, I was reminded you said something about the the uh, happiness of of being in the present moment. And I was reminded that uh, Bhikkhu Analio, who's a well-known Buddhist teacher, um, points out that there's a subtle, pleasant uh, sensation that comes with mindfulness. 
And I found that really helpful for my practice um, to, to try to recognize that. Wow. That <laughs> Sorry, knocked over my ring light. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, I, ju I just wanted to. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, you know, for, for people when they're meditating to just maybe try looking for that. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, this subtle, pleasant sensation. Good. That, that's really great, Jim. Thank you. And, and so it's kind of like turning the, it's like a, a selfie <laughs> with the mind. <laughs> Instead of looking at the object, like the breath, you look back at like, oh, how, what's the experience I'm having of being with this? And yeah, it's very, um, it strengthens our faith in the practice to realize, oh, just being mindful feels good. <laughs> and, and it motivates us to practice. Um, and then we can see that how at any moment in our day, uh, you know, you, you stop and you, oh, just take a breath. Oh, just being present. Uh, and that's why, uh, you know, I don't think we talk enough about how mindfulness being present brings out the beauty and richness of life itself. You know, when you, when you look at the sky, when you look at a tree, when you look at a baby, you know, just the experience, if you just glance, you know, there's just like, okay, I saw that. But when you look and you engage, then you see it like so much more clearly. I mean, uh, uh, Kama talks about when you're on retreat and you come out of the meditation hall, it's like the grass looks greener, you know, the sky looks bluer and everything is just, it again, really showing the power of mindfulness, how interesting it is. It's like, it's like our mind has different capacities for uh, actually perceiving and when we, you know, in our general perception, when we're just moving through life without focusing, we're just kind of like, there's all that stuff. And there's things are just coming and going by and we're just, but we have our mind set on something. We're, you know, I'm going up there, I'm going down, you know, I have to go do this. And so we're not really engaging, but when we stop and engage, it's like we sh shift into another gear or a deeper level of perception where actually things feel more intense and are perceived on a deeper and richer level. It's, it's the, the really the joy of mindfulness. Uh, it's not just like I'm present. It's like, oh, I'm alive. You know, this is life. It's, it's what I felt after my first retreat. I thought this is the first time I felt really alive. I didn't even know what being alive was until I sank into that experience of mindfulness in a deep way. Seems like a good note to end on. <laughs> so, yeah, try being alive today, at least for a few moments. Enjoy. Uh, look for that new happiness. And uh, I will see you on Friday if you can be, come back. Be well. <laughs>